Du nåede det lige. Sådan en morgen. Vi skal lige have det hele før der sidder ud af. Oh my god. Nej, nej, det kan jeg aldrig finde på at gøre. Jeg cykler et ganske godt. Nå, smart. Det går. Det er så dejligt. Det er sådan virkelig chill. Og tænker. Præcis. Præcis. Jeg vil gerne byde velkommen på Vejle første fremmest Dansk Kunstfond, som øh, har i gang sat tre designkort. Vi er ekstremt glade for at få lov til at placere det her i deres designcenter, så tak for det, Christian og hele holdet. I øh, dag skal vi tale om design thinking. Øh, det er Jens Martin og Christian, men øh, moderatoren er Heidi Laura, så vi kan alle byde velkommen til her nu. Ja. Godmorgen, velkommen. Øhm, på kinesisk skulle det angiveligt være en forbandelse, hvis man ønsker folk, gid du må leve i interessante tider. Fordi interessant er også uroligt, forvirrende, nyudvikling, alt det der sker. Og vi lever faktisk i interessante tider. Og også i tider, som bliver utilsomt krævende og overvældende og mærkelige, fordi vi står foran en gigantisk omstilling af hele måden, vi producerer på og måden, vi forbruger på måden vi indretter os på i vores byer, i vores boliger og alle mulige andre steder. Øhm, det stiller en masse nye, interessante opgaver til designfaget, som kommer til at være med til at svare på alle de kriser, der står foran os nu. Klimakrise, øh, biodiversitetskriser, truende ressourcekriser, der er ikke det, der ikke er. Øhm, men designfaget er ikke alene om de her ting. Designfaget læner sig mod... Naturvidenskaben læner sig mod arkitekturen, læner sig mod kunsten også, og finder nye samarbejdspartnere. Og det er det, der har været temaet. Det er det, der er temaet for de her morgentalks. I går snakkede vi om kunst og design, og hvordan de to ting finder hinanden og tænker nyt. I dag der hopper vi ligesom lidt et niveau op og taler om design thinking, altså om ikke bare at formgive genstande til vores til vores eget brug, men om at bruge selve designfagets grundtanke om at skabe forandring og forbedring i den måde, vi indretter os i verden på. Og for ligesom at forankre det lidt, så kommer vi særligt til at tale om trafik og transport i dag, som jo bliver et gigantisk udviklingsområde. Vi skal finde helt nye måder at organisere os. Netop så igen som svar på klimakrise, som svar på voksne byer, alt det, der sker i verden lige nu. Og det er derfor, at vi har, disse. Vi har Jens Martin Skibsted, og vi har øh, Christian Basen på besøg i dag. Og det kommer til at foregå sådan her, at først introducerer jeg Jens Martin, som holder et oplag. Så introducerer jeg Christian Basen, og til sidst så sætter vi os og snakker alle tre videre ud fra det, vi nu har fået lagt frem på bordet. Jens Martin er i dag partner i firmaet ManyOne som fusionerer strategi og design. Øh, og det er det seneste i rækken af adskillige firmaer, du har været involveret i på international plan øh, de seneste år. <laughs> øhm, og du har faktisk haft et, et særligt fokus på mobilitet, transport øh, igennem ret mange år, vil jeg forestille mig efterhånden. 20. Det var en hel del. Øh, og du, har også, du er også en af forfatterne bag uh, World Economic Forums. Øh, Rapport tidligere, guidelines for City Mobility blandt andet. Mm. Og nu får vi lov at høre en masse mere. Det er rigtig og, og, og flere, altså det, 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 det er mærkeligt for mig, at sidde her og vide, at der er nogen, som der overhovedet ikke kan forstå, hvad I siger, og det hele står på engelsk, også i alle kommentarer. Så det er bare lige en kommentar. Yeah. Øh, det er, det er fordi, at, at faktisk var det helt oprindeligt ting med en række internationale gæster i maj. Og siden er det rykket her til. Men jeg, er helt, jeg, jeg forstår udmærket, hvad du siger. Det er vi rigtig kede af. Ja, I, I can try and switch to English, because most Danes uh, do understand. And maybe just, we, we have been as confused as you have. Uh, in fact, in the app, it says in English that this is in Danish. Uh, so we yesterday switched from English to Danish on LinkedIn, for example. But I mean, from my 
I'm totally happy yeah, to do it. Just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go deep into the whole um, theoretical part of uh, design thinking um, because I know Christian Bason will cover uh, a lot of that. However, I will try and set the scene. Um, I've called design doing uh, as a uh, uh, thing that um, kind of is a direction that part of design thinking is taking. There's another one that's uh, getting a little bit more esoteric. So design thinking is not as such about thinking, but a process. So there's also kind of a um, design philosophy direction that I'm not going to cover today. And probably Kassin Basin is not going to cover it, um, it, uh, it either. Um, so th there are some major challenges that uh, design thinking is trying to solve uh, right now in terms, um, not, not of global challenges, but challenges for the field of design. Um, so things are speeding up rapidly. I think most can agree that uh, there's in terms of technology, things are uh, evolving exponentially, and all sorts of other parts in society seem also to um, increase the pace. Um, which means that this goal of trying to have simple solutions to complex problems gets very hard. So probably we need complex solutions to complex problems. So th that's one shift. And, and obviously the, there's the, the, the macro one um, about the world. Uh, you know, we, we have some global challenges, some, some mega trends that don't necessarily go uh, in, in the right direction. Um, this also means that design becomes way more uh, contextual. So just to reiterate, uh, I'm now part of, of many one. And um, so this is actually my first speech as a uh, many one guy, so this is a world premiere. Uh, and uh, it also means that I have way, way, way too many slides because I have no clue how this is going to go. Uh, so, so feel free and, and stop me and ask questions. Uh, you probably won't be uh, able to read half of the stuff that's up here. Um, just a, a, a quick um, run through about what uh, many one. Um, what, 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 what kind of is different from, from anyone? Well, one is we do everything. There was a slide before. And um, there's a certain aspiration, there's a certain goal with it, basically to better the state of the world. And uh, we, we also want to embrace uh, this, this pace, meaning we try to speed up things. And, and, and I'll show you an example of, um, of a product that we have. Uh, been, you know, that we, we've managed to do way faster than the industry norm. Uh, there are other examples, uh, but I've chosen two examples that, um, are, that, that I've personally been involved in. Um, so so um, the, the difference in terms of uh, being able to do everything, that we're not just a melting pot, uh, we are specific teams that sit uh, around the globe. Um, my specific speciality is mobility, and we are going to look into mobility. So these are the two um, kind of examples I'm going to have. I might not dwell on the last one uh, because it's not specifically mobility related, but it's kind of cool because it's initiated by Prince Charles. Um, and this one uh, is odd because it's a thing that's been done um, to a client that uses a brand name that I started. Um, so this is uh, the, um, the, the, the specific Biomega car example. And so uh, what uh, we'll try to address, I might not pinpoint it, uh, but this is the increased speed. Uh, so this specific project was done in um, you know, roughly, um, it, it took 15 months from actually having nothing to a fully functional um, prototype um, and um, yeah and, th and then it's also an example of this kind of complexity that we're in that, that we can't you can't make a car anymore that's siloed that's just um, uh, kind, of, kind of left on its own just dealing with the car industry you, you've got to deal uh, with uh, society uh, yeah anyway this is what I explained before that there are many um, 
specific um, teams. Um, <laughs> there's a need for radical thinking. You, you might have heard this uh, quite a few times, but, but basically these, uh, this increased speed makes some of the methodology that you have in desi design thinking obsolete or, or at least very challenged. Um, and this is basically uh, the, the stages of, of the car. And it is um, about uh, the, an industry in flux because it's challenged by all of these uh, exterior um, changes. Um, so the, the, the whole mobility landscape is, um, is going to change. So I think that that's one of the, uh, the, the, the founding uh, presumptions of having this uh, talk today. Um, and so, so there's a part of it that's uh, regulatory um, and th there's a part that comes uh, from the industry itself, how it's challenged in terms um, of making money. So um, to, today the, 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 there's quite a bit of, uh, of money being made uh, on, um, uh, on, on added um, gizmos. So that could be, uh, I don't know, a windshield, nice pair of, uh, of wheels. And there's obviously selling the cars themselves. And this is kind of, um, th this, th this is kind of shifting. So uh, the um, add-on businesses uh, are becoming more important than uh, the car itself. Um, and this is becoming more and more intelligent. So, so basically the, 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 the top of the pyramid now will more be how does the car integrate with society? What kind of um, services can you buy? You have uh, Tesla already trying some of this stuff, although it's still very uh, in, a, in a car silo. Um, it, it could easily add apps uh, on their platform uh, to accommodate this. So, 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 so these are some um, kind of typical uh, ways of, of, of seeing uh, transport. So you have the public transport um, or, or mass transit that tends to be public. You have um, ride hailing, which is kind of a new thing. This is, uh, you know, uh, Uber type things. You have sharing, you have the sharing scooters, you have the, the sharing bikes. Uh, you have renting, obviously these kind of fleets are, uh, are normal, leasing is increasing um, and then uh, you, you have kind of the old school private. But even on the private sector things are changing, people are owning completely different types of objects. I mentioned the mini scooter, but uh, I mean here in Denmark a young family, uh, they, they are not going to buy, uh, well at least specifically in the cities in Copenhagen themselves, young guys are not going to buy uh, a car because you get nowhere or at least very slowly uh, and, and in a very dirty way. Uh, so they, they're going to buy a cargo bike that's electric. It's one example of uh, kind of new typologies arising. Um, so, so, so that's really a movement within mobility that the objects we know today are not going to be the same as we'll know in the future. You know, even talking about bikes versus cars in the future might be completely obsolete. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a hybrid, you know, we, we might have three wheels, uh, cargo bikes that are recumbent with fairings, whatnot, intelligent. Um, so so we, we try to deal with that, we've tried to deal with that as a business model. So obviously design thinking is also designing a business and this is also again dealing with the doing bit of, uh, of design. Uh, if, if there's no kind of market or at least if, if, if there's no specific outcome that adds value, uh, whether it's to a public entity or a private entity, it's just not design. You know, it could be art or something else, it's not design. So here we've tried to uh, build a business model um, that, you know, around this, these um, many different objects that, that, that are going to be there. And then uh, we've, we've tried to uh, show how can you make money within these two um, different uh, ways of, of thinking car. Cars as an object. So cars as an object, they take time before you make some money, then you kind of plateau and you make a lot of money for a long time. And then at some point, people want to see the new 105. I don't think they exist anymore, but uh, let's say they want to see the new Golf or the, uh, you know, which, whichever they want to see the new model. And then uh, sales begin to slide. Whereas with these services, you can keep adding services that are no, uh, not necessarily linked to that specific object and 
that, that curve, in the beginning you make just about no money and you also see all of these um, you know, stock, stock listed uh, IT companies in the US where you think why would you stock list something that's making, not, not even making a dime but just in terms of user, based on users because then you can have this type of almost hockey stick growth. Uh, obviously consumers are, are changing, I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, so yeah, obviously also coming from Denmark, this is the old school bit of design uh, that you still need an object that attracts, right? So if you uh, make bikes or make a car that's utterly different, you've got to make it more attractive than let's say driving in a Range Rover. So I hope this wasn't a cue. Uh, okay, um, so, so, so you've got to attract people towards it. And that's also an inherent part of design. Design was, um, you know, originally conceived to be um, an, an aid or like facilitating more sales to companies. So, so that bit of making stuff attractive is still a mechanism that's out there. And we've, we've, we've done that with digging into a, um, uh, a Scandinavian iconography, uh, iconography coming from, um, from Denmark. So, uh, so, so the main bit we've wanted to add with this car is the fact that it's connected. So this is the IT bit, the services bit I've been talking about. Um, the iconic part, you could call it, if it, it, it might see, seem a, a, a little bit... Um, um, I don't know, self-aggrandizing, but, but there is a bit of this, at least trying to achieve to be iconic, um, to make this object attractive, to make it look good, etc. Um, then um, that it needs to be responsible, that's also part of this interconnected world where we need to think how do we avoid humans only to be in the center of things? How could non-humans which you uh, also kill when you drive a car, uh, not just by hitting a deer, but also by emitting pollution that also can kill animals, by building roads that uh, destroy habitat, etc. So this responsibility should be an inherent part of design in the future, I believe, we believe. Um, so this has been part of thinking the car. So at first we made uh, a non-functioning uh, concept, um, and let me see here. It actually won uh, uh, quite a few prizes. There's only one. It won. I like this one because it won the um, the, the car uh, prize in Germany. Basically, uh, the, the 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 best designed uh, branded car in Germany. And you know, it's ironic because a lot of the people that were kind of up against in terms of new uh, vision for the world, you know, is the the German car uh, industry or members of the car. Um, uh, German car industry. Um, anyway, so oh yeah, so may maybe I want to add the reason that you don't see this uh, in cars out on the street is not just because we have bad weather here. It's also because you cannot be certified um, as a I can't remember the specific name, but basically the what you will know as a car. <laughs> uh, but you're certified as an L7, which is a smaller 80 kilometer type of object. You have very few of them. Uh, in Denmark, but uh, the Tweezy would be an example of such. The Toyota iRoad is another example, but those are accepted, although they cannot withstand a car, um, a car hitting you from the side. So this is uh, how this concept car ended. It was built by some Germans as well, uh, by the, guy, the guys that um, uh, built the, uh, the prototype for the i3, the BMW i3. Uh, and they know what they're doing. This car is now in China. Um, and the second phase, this is the, the I mean, th this one is rendered. So what, that's one of the reasons it, it doesn't look as good. Um, but also this one could be certified as a car. Um, so, but, but again, it's built around not being a typical car. So in the sense that, um, it's, it's way narrower than a normal car, so uh, it's easier. It's, it's not um, shorter, but it's narrower, which means you can e easier navigate. It's electric, so you don't pollute as much. Um, and it's built around what we call in Denmark soft pedestrians, so that would be, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah, well, anyway, it's uh, pedestrians and uh, cyclists and all those who are easy to kill in traffic. 
so, uh, so you've got a, a lot of visibility uh, e, um, that, that, that works even when you drive very slowly. So for instance, we're the first uh, car company that, that has um, a fascia, that you, th this is what you call the fascia, the, the, the front bit uh, of the car, uh, that's transparent. So you can even see a duck. In, the, in Copenhagen, we stop when ducks uh, cross the road. Um, yeah, anyway, there, 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 there are some ways that we've tried to live up uh, to these goals. We've made it ultra simple. Uh, both in terms of looks, but also, as you will see, the way the interior has been thought. Um, super com uh, compact, though spacious. I'm going to get back to this. Uh, we have this kind of Scandinavian look um, and super easy to maintain. Uh, these are the specs. These are uh, aspects we would want to achieve. These are not necessarily how uh, it's going to get, but this is our aim. Might get better, might get worse. Um, and yeah, the, the, this is a general outlay. Uh, yeah, you can see the cabin. The interesting part of the cabin is since we've been able, able to remove this entire uh, engine bit, other people have done it, but they've not been able to remove the, the, the safety. Uh, other car companies have been able to remove the engine from here. It's a platform here. But what they have been able to remove is um, all the security bits that are here. So if you, if you have a frontal uh, impact, you need to have a ton of steel here. So we've been able to kind of um, uh, make that kind of uh, circumvent the center, uh, which means we have way, way more leg room than others. Um, also the length, add some leg rooms. So we had the leg room we have um, behind here is bigger than uh, the i3, for instance, which is all, uh, roughly the same size, but also like a, a huge Audi or BMW does not have more leg room uh, in the back. Well, of course, an A8 stretch is going to have it, but actually the A8 stretch for the front uh, passenger has way less room than this one. I mean, there's no limo on the world that has more leg room simply because there's nothing in front of you. Um, and you could also use it for, for luggage space or whichever. These are some of the engineering bits, so it's been thoroughly, uh, thoroughly engineered with ADAC guys. Uh, there's been a, a team of 26 engineers uh, that have been um, extremely talented, but also very challenges for us uh, to work with because it's been more or less a, a, a trench uh, war, you know, where we've tried to every day, or not every day, but every week, uh, been able to say, well, if we did this, we can move this two centimeters further, et cetera, et cetera, until we achieve these things that I mentioned before. Uh, so this one um, is fully packaged, which means we know exactly uh, where what goes. Uh, okay, so the in-car experience, I don't know how much time do I have left? Yeah, 10 minutes. Oh, okay, I'm actually pretty good. Uh, so the in-car um, experience was uh, used with kind of these typical uh, design thinking uh, methodologies. So, so desi design thinking uh, very broadly uh, is about, you know, researching uh, stuff then it's about get, ideating whatever you've researched. It's about getting some specific insights. Um, and then once you have these insights, you keep iterating to make it happen. And then obviously you need to implement it. Uh, as you've seen, we have implemented, uh, but, um, but here we really use some typical uh, design thinking methodologies, uh, like kind of an anthropological methodologies where we've been out testing so which, you know, how much can you see? So, um, yeah, basically, do you see enough in front of you, et cetera? Uh, th these are also part of, uh, of regulation. And then, as you can see, the, the interior is, is, is very different. We've, in a, in a way, been very inspired by old French cars from the 60s, 50s, um, 70s. Um, simply because they were really designed. They were not styled. Every time they just started from scratch and thought, oh, what can we do? You would have back then windshields, no, windshields, sorry, um, back mirrors uh, here, or they, they would just shift around. Um, a great example is why the Mini today um, is not really designed and not so interesting is because it's not designed, it's styled. Whereas the original, uh, original Mini Morris was designed and just a, a um, a very simple thing of actually turning the engine 
90 degrees made it possible to uh, squish it together. So, so, so this type of thinking with the engineers has kind of disappeared and this is what we've been trying to do. So a lot of this you'll probably know from um, all of the electronics, let's say your Mac computer or whichever today, it needs to be incredibly intuitive. You can't go in that car and then have to know, oh, this is here by convention, this is there by convention. Um, yeah, so, so, so one of the things we've done is uh, not only to have um, kind of the, 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 the back activated in terms of car, uh, sorry, in terms of camera, but also um, the, the, the side view mirrors. Um, uh, and, you, and you actually have to have them out here also by, by regulation, but they're part of this one big screen that sits way, way in front. Because we've been able to remove everything, it's like almost um, at the windshield, which means when you move the eye, you, you almost don't need to move the eye to see stuff, which again adds safety. Uh, yeah, there are all sorts of different um, scenario here. Um, the, these scenarios are uh, activated by some kind of uh, touchpad down here, but you can also actually uh, activate it uh, directly. Uh, sorry, this is the, uh, the, the touchpad, this is the screen. You can um, recognize, uh, you know, you can write by handwriting. Um, so uh, it's not meant for you to look down there, it, unless you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, you, you should intuitively be able to navigate the whole system just by having this kind of touch pad, uh, pad down here. So these are some of the same values I've already mentioned, so I'm not going to go through them um, again. There's one thing I would love to show. Uh, uh, maybe I have it uh, later. But, but this is all sorts of typical scenarios you would have in a car. Um, Obviously, we've also uh, had to design the interior. Again, there's some uh, old school uh, things like in all American cars, you would have a strap here instead of a handle. So there are all sorts of these things. I mean, you might be able to, nah, you, you can't really see how, uh, how much space there is down there. But this is actually free floating. So there's air here. The picture doesn't really serve it well. Um, yeah, it's a car. <laughs> and this is uh, how it looks. Uh, from uh, from the top, and um, and actually the the airflow down here there's some uh, there's some work in in that that um, I'm not going to cover here. Um, yeah, so so then there's all this interconnectedness um, that uh, you can choose whoever should be able to drive that car. So you can also rent it out in terms of peer to peer. It's like most things today on any digital platform that's uh, kind of habituary. Uh, so today you're not going to ask, can uh, you actually see my website uh, on my Android or iPhone, whichever. You simply cannot imagine a website that cannot do that. You know, in the, in, in the same way, you should not be able to imagine a screen on a car that doesn't do the same. It should be multi-platform to properly share it, to properly uh, be informed about services, about wherever you're going. This one is the one I wanted to go uh, back to, uh, karaoke. Uh, basically, uh, one of the designers was uh, freestyling, but I kind of like that because everybody is uh, singing in cars. Well, at least I do, and everyone in Hollywood uh, movies do. Um, yeah, so there's um, all sorts of tourism, um, all sorts of serv services. This one is about uh, tourism, you know, how, how do I get around in this specific city? And there's the whole business part of it. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into it, but um, the, the, the big difference here is the way that the car is, is shared is not kind of a centralized system or even a, a distributed system um, that's, um, a, a, you know, and, um, that's, that's managed by one company that goes out to everybody. This is a service, a license you would give to specific people that then rent it out. So uh, these would be examples. Uh, hotels, they rent out um, bikes today. They do not rent out these cars. Workspaces, um, you know, part of where, where we are now uh, is a workspace 
why don't they also facilitate this instead of, uh, um, you know, you have to have your uh, work uh, car or the car sponsored by your company and uh, bigger apartments um, that, uh, you know, add services to, um, to their, you know, to their buildings. And, you know, so these are some examples of how that could look. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a branded experience that goes, that runs through everything. And that brand, okay, anyway, these are the phases of the business, the rollout. And actually here the rollout would, uh, of the services would be bike-centric and not car-centric. So we start only with bikes. Oh, uh, and um, yeah, this is a typical campaign. Obviously, that's also uh, graphic design, uh, branding. Um, parts of marketing are also classical parts of, uh, uh, of the uh, design uh, field, right? So, so we also do that part. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know how much time do I have left. I have two minutes left. So um, I'm not really going to go through uh, this example because Basically, it's, it's too much to go through. But this is an, uh, another example. And it, again, it's based on this change of behavior, change of world. How do we um, uh, do that? And this one is not on a micro level. So of course, uh, having a car in an ecosystem might seem a bigger thing in terms of being part of urban mobility in general. How does it interlink with a scooter? How does it interlink with a car, a uh, sorry, a, uh, a train, a bus, etc. cetera? Uh, you know, how does it become multimodal? But there's also on, on the greatest uh, level of all, how do we turn business into being sustainable? And, um, and so, so, so the backdrop of that is obviously that people's behavior is changing. And one of, and, and this is one of the parts we need to uh, kind of cater to when we accept uh, the, the, the complexity. People are starting, not only designers, to have to build in complexity or be part of that complexity, but people are also uh, starting to accept that there's a par paradigm that's not just about convenience, right? If you take classical design thinking, it's about adding convenience to people. But people today will uh, actually accept to um, have a bit of hardship to, for instance, um, uh, solving uh, global warming. Uh, so I have a lot of friends that have gone on vegetarian diets, a lot of friends that have shifted away from driving cars or, or taking planes to wherever they go. Of course, there are trans some transcontinental challenges, but within Europe, uh, they will travel within their own continent. They're going to travel around by train. These are some of the, the guys. And this is uh, the, the uh, initiative we're working on right now, uh, which is um, a project that we're doing uh, for Prince Charles that he's working on with uh, the World Economic Forum, but it's initiated by his foundation. Um, and this is really what he's uh, dedicated to. So as, as I said, I'm not uh, going to go through this, it's, you know, if you want to change the all markets in the world, the complexity for sure is not going to go down. So uh, wrapping up all of um, the markets uh, globally today is not going to happen. Um, I might just want to add that what I and our team specifically are working at is the digital strategy and a whole certification part of it, how we certify products as being green. And one of the instruments we're using that is fundamentally different than the other people he's worked with is that we try and merge two cultures. Right now, in terms of innovation, you tend to have this disruptive uh, kind of school and culture that comes originally from the Bay Area and still very much is centered around that geographic zone. And you have this kind of more economic, um, um, rational uh, kind of adding specs approach how do we change things incrementally accepting uh, this is where we are and um, we cannot do uh, uh, without both of them so uh, what we really want to do is see how can then they not um, they don't need to merge because that's that's probably utopian but at least they need to use the same metrics right they talk in different languages they talk in different with different cultures and they don't compare apple and pears, or they do compare apple and pears, and they need to compare apples and apples or pears and pears. So this is 
one of the ways uh, we want to help him with these specific things. So yeah, anyone in, many one, <laughs> there was a company doing it, not me personally. So with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you uh, for your time. Thank you. I'll just continue speaking English then. And I'm very happy to introduce Christian Bays. And actually, this is his home turf. <laughs> He's the yes. director of the Danish Design Center and is involved in so many different kinds of design and design initiatives, also including fashion and many more other things. But you'll be talking about design thinking. Yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Danish Design Center. How many of you have been here before? OK, right, a few. Uh, and so for those of you who haven't or who don't work ordinarily with design, it's, um, this space is not really a center because it's not a place you can visit as an ordinary tourist or visitor uh, to Copenhagen or a citizen. Uh, but we work with uh, businesses, with uh, government, uh, nationally and internationally, on advancing design. I'll get back to uh, what that means uh, uh, in, my, in, my, in my talk. I haven't brought any slides with me because I knew from, uh, from, uh, in advance that uh, Jens Martins would be much cooler than anything I could come up with. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's kind of strange to show slides when you're actually here. Um, but let me start with a story. So when I grew up in the um, way, 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 way long time ago in the, in the 1970s, I grew up in a little bit of a strange family. My father's from the United States. That's where my last name is from. And my mother is Danish. And I grew up with uh, recycling of, um, uh, we had a, a compost, so we recycled our, our uh, food uh, waste. Uh, this is in the mid 70s. Uh, and my father, who, uh, who was a physicist, even uh, did a little contraption. So when you opened a drawer in the kitchen to throw away uh, something, uh, the um, food basket where you put in the waste food would have a lid on and it, will, it has a string attached to it and it will open up, when you open up the, the door, the lid would come off little design solution to make sure that the waste food doesn't uh, smell. Uh, and then you had an another box for, for plastics and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and even today, when I visit my parents, they still have that little contraption you open up and you have the, the separation. Uh, they also drove a very old uh, gasoline guzzling uh, gray Volvo. Uh, but on the back of it, it said, uh, uh, nuclear energy, no thanks. Remember that? Atomkraft Nightak? Um, and I also grew up with some uh, digital and technology uh, because my slightly strange American father thought this idea of uh, e-mobility, electric mobility, was smart in, um, let's say, 1976. So he got hold of a contraption you, s you could put onto your bicycle and make it into an electric bike. So I remember when I was four or five years old sitting on my father's uh, ordinary bicycle, but with this uh, electric engine strapped onto it, that strapped onto the wheel, and actually driving really, really fast on an electric bicycle. So that's when I grew up, and that is by now a very long time ago. And funnily enough, today we are still discussing the green transition, the societal transitions in the social space, and we're discussing the technology and the electric mobility transition. So we've known and worked with and been aware of, at least in parts of society, for more than 40 years, that these are transitions and changes we need to go through. And why aren't we further with it? How can that be? There's a scholar who's actually not recognized as a design scholar, really, but he actually is. His name is Donald Schoen. He wrote a book in 1971. It was called um, Beyond the Stable State. And uh, being a political scientist, so I'm not a designer, I'm a political scientist. I have a PhD in design and leadership, but basically I'm coming out of uh, politics. Um, and reading a book called Beyond the Stable State, Beyond the Stable Government, but actually he also talked about be beyond a state of stability, a situation where we are stable. And Donald Schoen has a really nice quote in that book. He says, in order to transform the system, we have to move through zones of uncertainty. So a zone of uncertainty, for example, I think is when Jens Martin or an, and or his colleagues at many one ask themselves way new questions about what might uh, a car design actually look like. 
is also uncertain. I mean, we saw some very nice business plans. Do you see the plan where you know, you're going to sell that many units of cars and so many people will s sign up subscriptions and there'll be that much revenue and the money will come flowing in? It's all, I, I really hope it, 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 it'll happen, but it's uncertain. And building new business models, new, new mobility platforms, uh, even the Prince Charles initiatives with all the royal uh, background, it's uncertain whether that is actually going to work. And so the question becomes, and this is what's fascinated me as a political scientist with design, is that there's a particular group of professionals in our society whose job it is to work within zones of uncertainty, who are more comfortable than most with being in spaces of decision making and making choices where you cannot see what is going to work. So to me, design is an entirely new, it's not a new world, it's actually an old one. I mean, 1971, that's a long time ago. Even before that, there was a lot of writing on, there was writing on design thinking. But it's a world where you take a particular look at change, creation, uh, shaping uh, services, products, things in society that takes a radically different starting point than most of us do. When I say most of us, I mean those who have grown up in a world where we pretend and believe in rationality, in command and control, and in a so-called scientific way of managing organizations. So it struck me at one point when I was doing my, my, my PhD research that we often talk about solutions. Right? Have, you, have you heard the world solving problems? You heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we have to find a solution to something. Now the word solution comes from mathematics, you know that? It's a mathematical idea. You solve an equation, right? And there's a right and a wrong answer. So the idea, and that was adopted into management in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And some of those who adopted it into management were those who tried to solve the Vietnam War, for example. The, uh, the whiz kids uh, who were, uh, at one point, the American uh, m m Department of Defense, the McNamara, was the Minister for Defense try to deploy algorithms and mathematical formula and analytics and quantitative measures to solve and deal with Vietnam. And in companies today, even today, some of the clients that Jens Martin's company works with, some of the many, many companies that we work with, have an, an, an idea that you can solve problems such as the future of mobility, such as uh, when it comes to politics, such as uh, immigration or integration. Uh, we can solve uh, homelessness or unemployment. Uh, we can sort of uh, uh, solve uh, uh, consu uh, consumers being uh, uh, worried about climate change and what to do with it. And of course, there's absolutely no way we're going to solve those kinds of complex problems. As Jens Martin said, for a complex problem, you probably need a kind of complex so solution. Or what you might need is to have a humility and, and respect that you can make a, a, a difference to the problem, but you're never going to solve it. So that's the, la the language of management historically and, and the world we live in, in our workplaces, in our organizations, and the way in which most professions ad address challenges is by thinking we can, we can solve it rationally. That includes, by the way, those great, great, great engineers that uh, are, uh, are, are struggling to design a car and working with the constraints that the designers are pushing them to say, can you do it a bit different, a different, different? Uh, and there's a conflict there. It's actually a conflict often, uh, or a, a dialogue happening between designers on the one side and other professions on the other one. Where designers are the force, or design is the force that pushes the boundaries, that challenges conventions, that asks, why couldn't this be different? Yesterday, I read a piece in, uh, in the news uh, where someone uh, from a Danish agency was writing about um, how we treat older people in uh, care homes. Have you uh, seen or heard about the television show about uh, people with dementia in Denmark in Danish care homes and where uh, a couple of old people were video uh, recorded uh, uh, in secret and you saw how uh, staff were treating them? And so that's, a, that's for us, so that's a design problem. It's like, how would you design a care system that would uh, base, be based on empathy and based on uh, ways of caring for people? And what are the systemic ways you could change that? So to us, and now let me try to define design thinking for you, which we haven't done yet. To me, design thinking, and Bridget Martin has hinted at it several times, design thinking is first and foremost uh, the ability to step back and ask what, what characterizes the problem. 
and start with a problem rather than with a solution. So that might be surprising to some of you because often when you see something that's designed, you see something very tangible. You see a car, you see a bike, you see a chair, you see a digital app, whatever. But the way in which designers work is by starting to ask what's, what's even the problem we're needing to address here. Not solve, but address, to work with. Secondly, design, of course, is about creativity. It's about, as Jens Martin said, ideation, getting ideas. These days, there's a growing humility among designers that maybe they don't always have the best ideas themselves. So it might make sense to listen, as many one did with designing the car, to customers, consumers, partners, uh, of course, other fields of expertise, uh, and bringing in uh, many, many different voices in, in co-creating new ideas and new concepts. And thirdly, design is about um, experimentation. It's about understanding that if we're going to change things in the world, we have to not believe we can think things through in advance, but actually try out what could work and do different prototypes, different t uh, trials and different uh, uh, try out different avenues uh, and getting feedback and learning uh, before then arriving at a, at a better solution. Interestingly, the article yesterday about the dementia and the care in, in Denmark uh, one of the uh, recommendations from the, the author from a Danish uh, uh, agency for patient, patient safety was um, we have to build learning organizations. And interestingly, if you want to build a learning organization, you could actually learn from designers. Because designers' practice is based on rapid learning from what works or what does not work as they craft, as they build, as they test and try out different uh, solutions. So design thinking it's just a way of trying to articulate what designers do when they do what they do. It's not new at all. The first book I came across with the title Design Thinking was from, uh, from 1987. Uh, the first book that really addressed how design can, uh, can work with these big complex problems is from 1969, a few years before the Stable State book. It's by um, uh, Her Herbert Simon, the Nobel Prize winner. The book is called uh, The Science of the Artificial because design is really about everything we make in the world. It's about how do we make, what do we put into the world. And I'll give you a case example in a moment, but basically, as you also saw illustrated, I think very nicely, design, you can design anything from a very concrete thing, artifact, to a service, to a system. So think about design spanning from what is the thing going to be doing to how we're going to digitally enable cars to be part of a rental system or, or, or a mobility system and how does that connect with data with other systems. So you work at these different scales and this, this ability to work at different scales and say whatever is needed we can build that is I think essential in design. Now design thinking has been a word I actually have been trying to avoid for many many years uh, because it has to tend, to tended to reduce design as a profession to process as Jens Martin actually also mentioned. That means if you Google design thinking, you'll see all these step guides to first you do this, then you do that, then you do that. It's a methodology. If you just use the methodology, everything will be great. It'll be both be creative, it'll look great, and uh, you'll create change. That's not the case. Design thinking is actually not about a methodology. It's about a way of looking at the world and of working with the world. It's just one way of articulating what, uh, what uh, design uh, can be. And Jens Martin and I are right now uh, working on a book that uh, seeks to sort of um, stretch or expand our perspective on that because we need to really understand the power of design in a different scale to address the challenges we have. So at the Danish Design Center, we do work with uh, the green transition. We work with the uh, digital transitions we need to make, including in digital ethics and how we design ethical, ethical digital products. And we work in many ways with the social uh, domain, so that means everything from uh, uh, social care to uh, health care and the future of health uh, to uh, education and learning. Uh, if you want to take a look at the bandwidth of design in Denmark, you just take a look at the uh, Danish Design Award, which we run every year together with Design Denmark, the uh, Industry Association for Design. And you can see an extremely broad bandwidth of what design can actually be, just looking at what the, the, the finalists and winners are for that award. I'm going to give a concrete example of how we work uh, here on, on mobility, which has been uh, the theme and the way we illustrate what design thinking can be today. So some time ago, um, a, a local government, uh, a municipality, reached out to us uh, from a, a, what you might call a slightly sort of a, a, a regional uh, part of Denmark that's uh, not a city. So the municipality is Forborg Midfyn. 
for Borre Midfyn Kommune. And uh, even though by driving, uh, this uh, local government is maybe just a half an hour away from Odense, which is uh, one of the biggest cities in Denmark, uh, it's actually considered uh, uh, rural and uh, far away. And it's a place, like so many others, where people are moving away. Young people are leaving, families are leaving, uh, education institutions have a hard time keeping young people. Uh, there's a much more of an, of an aging society. Uh, there's no dynamism. And it's just a trend that's just ongoing. And so that's a complex, difficult, big problem for that uh, area, for the politicians. It's a problem for business that can't thrive there. It's a problem for people living there. It's probably also a problem for our society as a whole to not have coherence and connectivity. And we have some regions that are becoming poorer and poorer and others that are becoming richer and richer. And part of the challenge in that area is mobility. Not the only challenge, there are many, many others, but one of them is mobility. And, and uh, they reached out to us and said, could we redesign mobility? Uh, what, what might that mean for this entire area? One of the things we did to explore the problem was actually to connect with uh, Jens Martin and his uh, colleagues at the World Economic Forum's uh, uh, group on, 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 uh, on cities, uh, experts from all over the world who work on the future of cities. And we said to them, might you join us here in Copenhagen, right here in this building, to discuss not cities and the future of mobility in cities, but actually discuss the future of mobility in a rural area. Take, would you like to take on that challenge and help us with ideas? The idea of co-creating with some experts and getting insights. And they actually did that, and they all came here, and we worked in this very space uh, together with about 20 uh, experts from all over the world to give the local government new ideas. And we had the um, uh, head of the municipality standing right here and, and speaking to the group uh, and trying to do that in English, which was not so easy, but he, he did it. Uh, and they then got hard to work in coming up with ideas. It's also so that if you want to address a complex problem like how do we transform mobility in, a, in, a, in an area that's, uh, that's uh, challenged, um, you have to get in uh, every actor that matters. It's citizens, it's local government's own internal workers and professionals, but it's certainly also business. And we asked ourselves here, because we work quite extensively with, with business, and as Jens Martin said, design has always been about business. It's always been about, at least historically, mostly about uh, achieving commercial success by designing uh, uh, powerful products and services and experience that people will want to buy. We said, well, is there also some business opportunities? If we can find companies that can help be part of the, the solution here, maybe they can both get business in, in uh, Forbois Midfyn, but maybe also around the world. So just to give a couple of examples of what, what we came up with by running workshops with the citizens, workshop with staff, uh, trying to ask ourselves what are the ordinary lives of young people and older uh, people here in the area, um, and go also getting in uh, the political level because are there also regulations and policies that need to be redesigned? Again, working from the very concrete to the very abstract. So let me take an example that's both extremely concrete but also very, very abstract uh, in redesign, which we've now proposed to the uh, local government. So one of the problems in mobility in the area is that if you take your bicycle in the morning and you need to bike, let's say, 8 kilometers or 10 kilometers to your school or to your uh, youth education, what is it like, do you think, to get out in morning traffic on small, winding rural roads at 8 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning, where everybody is trying to get to work fast? Is that safe for kids to go out biking on those kinds of roads? Actually, so unsafe that nobody does it. And that means that kids are actually not biking, which means that there's a mobility problem. And then people have to get two cars, gasoline cars, or they have to wait for a bus that doesn't come, or they have to get more buses, and so on. So we asked ourselves, and this came out of the creative process, working on what's the problem here. What if every morning between, let's say, 7 in the morning and 9 a.m., some of the main rural roads that are not so much used otherwise are changed by law into bike paths, only for bicycles. So for a, a limited period of time, you transform a road to a bicycle path. And so cars can't go. And cars will have to take a longer route, but they can, you know, you're just driving, that's fine. And then all the kids, all the young people can go on the bike lane. And again, at 2.30 or 3 o'clock when school's out, for another couple of hours, again, you transform also legally the road to a place where you can bike. 
So the practical question, of course, is, okay, how many kids will bike there? How do you tell them about it? How do you communicate it? Do you do a campaign? Do you do some nice graphics? Do you hand out flyers? Do you inform at the school? All the branding and, and, and just getting everybody to move there. But the other one is you have to get the legislation changed. That's a question of redesigning national law and allowing a local government to transform roads. And what's the procedure for that? Nobody knew. So we, of course, involved then the Transport Authority of Denmark in saying, what would that redesign look like at the systems level? Because you need the system to change for, in order for the mobility to change. We developed a whole lot of other concepts. And actually, we have a catalog. We just, it's not even ready yet from the printer, but it's, we have a prototype ready with all kinds of concepts about, for example, uh, how can you take, uh, could it be that local citizens who are older and who all own cars that are just sitting in the, in, the, in the garage, let's say they're 70 years old, 75, 80, still have a driver's license, never use their car, could they either drive kids to school in a kind of, kind of carpooling and connect with the kids, or could they uh, 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 lease out or rent out or, or, or just allow their car to be used by, by others? Now, that's not very sustainable because there's still uh, uh, gasoline being used or diesel, but at least it's a, mobil it's a, it's a, it's a solution to the mobility challenge. We also uh, discovered a, a concept about creating uh, local mobility hubs where you have a bus stop, but where you could also have pickup stops for uh, local residents to pick up anyone who's, who's, who's there waiting for transport. That's just examples. So let me conclude so we have time for the, uh, for the conversation to say that in a way I'm, a, I'm like a, um, a recovering uh, analyst. Uh, I grew up in a, in a world in uh, political science and in management consulting where I thought that uh, just applying rational and analytical and data to problems, uh, we, could, we could solve them. Uh, to starting out on a journey about 15 years ago discovering uh, how designers approach uh, change in a very, very different way. And it's as, as if, you know, you can ask yourself, why has the Danish Design Center existed since 1978 with the mission to bring design to business and society? And I think part of it is that the forces that drag us into the usual way of doing things are too strong. The forces in the professions, whether it's nursing, it's uh, transport, it's engineering, it's management, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, law, economics, are so strong that each of those silos of do knowledge, each of those domains will want to dominate and will come up with their own, in a way, self-serving solutions that will be good for their profession or good from their mindset, but not necessarily good for people or for the planet. And someone needs to come in. And when somebody needs to keep pushing for someone else to coming in, to being the glue and the, and, and the dynamic force that brings everything together to make a, a positive change for someone else. A positive change from someone else, that is, you can call it citizens, you could call it uh, consumers, you could call it uh, nature, you could call it the planet, you could call it a positive change for life, but someone needs to take that perspective. And someone needs to bring in the skills, the thinking, the attitudes, and the methods, of course, and the methods to make it happen. That's what designers do. That's what they've always been doing. And that's where we need many more designers to do on some of those big, big challenges we're facing. That's why I don't think we'll be, I think we'll still be relevant for a little while longer. And I really look forward to discussing your questions with us in a moment. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Professor. Excuse me, sure about what is education to choose to become a designer because Good. this is there's going to be so much to do in this field in the future which is very contrary to what people usually think about the design field it's much more of this concept of designing nice things but this was really interesting to kind of begin imagining how how very differently we're going to work through all these different crises and 
create the change that we need. So let's try to kind of look into the future because now, now we know a little bit more about a new type of car that might help us designing new kinds of transportation. We have some idea about how to work with the basics, really. But what you were talking about sounded like what is possible to do right now. But wouldn't we have to kind of project further into the future, really think about what is transportation going to look like in 50 years, in 100 years, with new sources of energy and everything changing around us? I think that's a question for you, Jens Martin. How do we begin imagining a complete transformation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, it's, it's a thing we, we, we cover in our book. So just read it now. Yeah. <laughs> Coming soon. This is not the <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, well, uh, so so in a way, it's already happening. It's just not happening systematically. So, um, for instance, uh, sci-fi flicks, um, you would would see them as kind of, you know, entertaining stuff, um, just playing around with some ideas. But 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 if you look at um, you know a lot of stuff has actually um, been implemented later. So it's an, it has a huge impact on designers and has had a huge impact on scientists actually to, to prove that some of these things are right. So in terms of mobility, but the flying type, uh, there's an, uh, what do you call it, ionic thruster, whatever, I can't remember, but, but, but basically with electricity, you change um, the uh, the uh, the electron charge from positive to negative constantly, and so you have this flying thing without any propeller, without any jet. So 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 this comes from Star Trek, right? So there's a Star Trek idea there. Um, but there's also a part that's being done in terms of um, some regimes, which uh, you know, to democracies, might not have all the answers. Uh, they, they um, you know, have, have much more consistency in terms of what they can do. So they can actually, um, if, if they pass a law now, they can expect it to still be in place in 50 years if they choose to, uh, if they choose so. Um, in a democracy, uh, you'll probably have a secure lifetime of four years um, at best. Right, so um, not at best, but anyway, it's it's not uncommon that the other government will will just r rule against it. Um, so um, so 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 the, these fifty years plans um, and uh, even hundred year plans already exist. So, uh, but 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 it's a thing that um, I and I know Christian also really believe needs to be kind of um, appropriated by design. Um, because design inherently is about projecting stuff. You just need to project further ahead. And I also think one of the, you know, to me, design is what philosophy uh, was in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. um, back then, philosophy also, in a, in a way, was about implementing stuff, implementing stuff in democracies, even um, making very, very kind of specific objects. Um, but, uh, but, but today, uh, the field that owns this part of imagining possible worlds is, um, well, coupled with doing, is design. But could you disclose a little bit what kind of ideas are out there? What are we looking at if, when people really do this projecting into the future, imagining different systems of, of transportation? Not sci-fi, but... Yeah, no, so, so the challenge with uh, mobility and specifically urban mobility that I'm, I'm very focused on, um, is that it's, you know, as we talked about, uh, th things kind of um, fit within a context. Mm -hmm. So they're extremely contextually, uh, con contextual. So if you, um, uh, there are very few words that, that describe a city is uh, this type of city. You tend to say it is like Copenhagen, for instance. Mm -hmm. So when, when you want to see uh, biking lanes all over, you talk about uh, Copenhagenizing. Copenhagenization, and um, so uh, so, but 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 that's because these uh, solutions need to fit within that city. So um, a city uh, like uh, Bogota that has kind of a crater that's true for Me uh, Mexico City as well that that have this kind of crater theory could work for Paris as well. You know, you, you sit in this kind of. Um, Hole, then uh, a uh, what, what are they called? Uh, Telecabine in French. Uh, 
Oh, these kind of things that you see on, on ski uh, sports places, what are these called? Um, cable cars, cable cars. Um, they work well in Hong Kong. That's extremely, with extremely steep hills, you have, hills, you have these uh, kind of uh, escalators. Uh, so it means it's very difficult to project anything general. Uh, but uh, one thing that all agree on is that it needs to be multimodal. There are only... There's probably only one type of, uh, of transport that we know we can't get around, and that's walking. Right? It's, it's, it's not, not going to work without walking. Um, so uh, the challenge in terms of projecting, um, and, I, and I think when I was there for uh, Fobro Municipality, it was a bit of the same. People want to hear either that you're going to continue doing what you do, you're just going to you know, incrementally change it. So it's going to be better and better and better, and you'll know, slowly change. The other one is this disruptive uh, thought. Oh, we're going to implement all of these crazy things. We're going to have, um, let's say, drones that transport people in cities, which actually physically makes no sense at all <laughs> because, um, you know, one is uh, they're not very secure, but also because they are noisy and project air downwards. So it's like having an air dryer on top of, uh, of your head, there's no way we can get around that also in terms of energy efficiency compared to a bike that's the world's most efficient object ever created um, across any mammal. Uh, not that they create um, gizmos, but, but you, we tend to think they're more efficient than we are. So, so, so there's no uh, real answer to that. Um, but uh, I, I think the main, battle, the main battleground we have right now in many, many cities is uh, the battle between um, um, bikes and cars. Uh, the most efficient, the least efficient. Um, so, so cars are inefficient in terms of, uh, you know, they're slower than bikes in traffic because, you know, you can't get around if there's a car in front of you. Uh, they, they also pollute way more. Um, even if you take an electric car, um, they will pollute more in the sense that you actually need to produce this energy somewhere and there's, they're roughly 20 times less efficient, 27 times less efficient uh, than a bike. This of course is an average number uh, and not true for any um, context than any car. So these kind of fight. Uh, the, the problem for bikes is that um, they need to uh, transport kids and, and goods, right? So, so uh, very few people will just uh, leave their kids and say, ah, fuck that. Uh, so you actually have to bring them along um, and, um, and that today the, the car can facilitate. And the car has these other challenges that you go nowhere. Um, so what, what the cars are trying to do is basically get smaller to compete with the bikes. What the bikes are trying to do is not because it's, it's self-interesting, but they're trying to get bigger mm. so you can have um, uh, uh, kids in there, uh, possibly uh, many kids and even groceries. So, um, so these are kind of merging into a new type of vehicle mm. that we don't know yet, a, a new type of three-wheeler. And I guess we have to imagine a lot of added flexibility also that you can change from one, one thing to another easier kind of you can go from the train to your extra big bike to you then change to something else when you need to go go, go a little further i imagine this is that's happening now that's, that's not the future now. this is yeah. what people are working on now how do you seamlessly and that's also part of the work mm -hmm. with the car how do you seamlessly get in from that car to the bike uh to the bus to the train they all have different advantages so yeah, th this is, uh, and, and that's a service. Mm. Um, not that I think, you know, it, it needs to go that, um, it needs to be a service, but, but it probably will uh, to a large uh, extent. People also imagine these things becoming driverless. I still think there's room for private transport, but I also think there's still room for driver full uh, transport. Uh, there are certain things where you actually want to have that control, this type of, the, the, the space that cars occupied with this freedom. You could just jump in the car and go anywhere. And, uh, you know, um, it was great. And James Dean uh, died doing it. You have this whole mythology, uh, uh, mythology around it. Um, that is now being uh, uh, appropriated by bikes. 
because end of the day you can go nowhere with these cars you know like how, how do you get anywhere if you're stuck in traffic right so 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 this kind of freedom of movement is is, is still there and it might might be the bikes kind of doing that but you're right uh, things are going to fundamentally change mm. also in terms of ownership and service and mm. multimodality. But as you said, Christian, it, there is this feeling that things are changing very slowly. We have yeah. been aware of the problem for a, yeah. a very long time. So, and you, and, and we kind of felt also that, that there is this, this short political horizon, mm. which is certainly putting a stop to things. But what is really going on here? Well, so I think one is the timeline. So, so as Martin said, I mean, how do we speed them up? Uh, how do we get another pace? And you can say that um, there are different speeds out there, right? In a sense, you can say that politics uh, is quite slow moving, uh, regulation is slow moving, systems change is slow moving, especially when you look about what happens across borders, so globally. Uh, then you have um, uh, business. Business is somewhat faster moving. Some parts of business, like fashion and so on, is quite quick moving. But then you have design and innovation uh, work, which is very fast, can be extremely fast. I mean, you can imagine things in an afternoon if you want to. You can even render them and, and draw them and make up all kinds of uh, future directions if you want to. And the question is, how do you bring those different speeds or different, different paces together in a way that's even further looking, right? Uh, maybe I, I, I'm pretty much a big proponent of democracy, uh, but how do we pretty make... Much. Uh, pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much, mostly, even though I, I've seen, you know, we, we, I've seen in uh, Dubai or in uh, Asia how, how quickly you can uh, both decide on things, but also how, how long-term you can think. Uh, but maybe we need to adopt some of those things, both the action and dy dynamism of that, but also the long-term thinking. I mean, we could, we could use a dose of that in our societies, bring that back in. I think that one of the things design brings to the space is to remember it's all about outcomes. Right? So an engineer would say, we need to put contraptions into the city, technologies, right? And, and ask, you know, what technology is appropriate? Uh, and regulators would probably say, what's the law that's needed? What about safety? It's always important to regulators and policymakers. What's, what's safe? and they want to minimize risk, right? But a designer would say, what's the outcome? And an outcome here is that people can move as freely as possible and, and with the lowest possible footprint on our planet as possible. And uh, what design can then bring in, in that equation, by the way, I think is uh, actually um, uh, 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 making it attractive, uh, enjoyment, um, uh, and, and a, a positive experience. I mean, we, we can't be James Dean in the old way anymore in, in our fast, more cars, but maybe we can have an experience of being cool, of being free. I mean, when I see Copenhageners uh, ride on some of the newest, uh, what well, could be a Biomega, could be something else, like a really cool, well-crafted, beautifully designed, well-functioning, high-quality uh, e-bike or a, uh, or, uh, a cargo bike, uh, e-powered cargo bike, one of them, by the way, uh, won our uh, Danish Design Award this year. Uh, you know, that's maybe the new cool, right? That, that's a, and you, don't have, you don't have to smoke uh, or, or drive a Porsche to be cool. Actually, it's even more cool, at least seen in, in the eyes of, of your fellow Copenhageners, to be driving one of those, right? So there's a shift in, 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 in awareness and in what, what's, what makes sense to you, what's meaningful to you, and what meaning you project, what is your identity. And the ability to work with meaning, with identity, with what's aesthetic or attractive, uh, joyful, that's the domain of designers. It's also actually the domain, if you stretch it all the way out, you discussed art yesterday, it's also the domain in a sense of art because it's what's the human experience, uh, what are all the emotional sides of this, how can you play, play with that, how can you explore it, inquire into it. Designers make it practical. They, they, they turn it into concrete services or concrete products that you can experience and engage with. And, and that's the power, right? So that's a power to shift our human behavior Partly, I mean, some sacrifice will be have to made. Your friends will have to eat more vegan, maybe. Uh, but a lot of the power to change is about making the, the alternative more attractive, right? Making it more cool, more attractive to be in that e-bike than being in that uh, gasoline car, for instance. And, 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 and then looking at how the outcome is that mobility, freedom of, to move with low footprint. I think that's, that's sort of the vision. And then designers can draw all kinds of renderings of possible futures, sci-fi or not the power to make it tangible. It could be like this, it could be like that. One of the things we work with here at the Danish Design Center is exactly scenarios and foresight, uh, very long term. We've worked on 2050 scenarios, both for actually mobility, for uh, health, for uh, work and education. And it, those futures we look at are uh, not certain in any way. Actually, they're alternative futures that might happen. So by opening up the future space and saying it could be this future, cities could be like this, 
you mentioned different cities around the world that might look quite differently. Well, if you have a picture of those different options or those different outcomes, then you can make more informed choices today. You can start making decisions already now. If you're a company, which we work quite a lot with, or if you're a policymaker, or even if you're a designer, say, asking yourself new questions. And so I agree that the future, uh, I mean, you should encourage people to become designers, <laughs> but you should be encouraging people to become designers that know very, very deeply that being a designer is not about what you create. Because that creation can be anything from a policy to a chair, to a car, to a bicycle, or to a digital service. Being a designer is the way in which you work with problems mm. and work with those opportunities that are in those problems. And you work with it from a human and maybe even more planetary perspective where everyone else, every other profession, works from the inside out in projecting what they think is right. It feels like we should be very aware of this mental shift that is part of the whole transformation that is going to take on, that is going to happen in these next uh, decades. That, that people, has to happen at least. People, it has to happen. That, that people have to kind of get to know these new processes, ways of moving everything. So this kind of experiment that you were doing in this rural area, uh, this seems like an interesting model for how to go about this, kind of try something out and get people involved. Is, is this a way to move forward? It's one model, In I the think. political layer too, maybe? Yeah. I think it's one model. I think it's, um, uh, I mean, po politics is conservative, right? Hmm. It's a uh, word about risk. Uh, I was running a workshop a year or two ago in, uh, in Canada and somebody said about politics, it was a senior civil servant, he said, my minister is okay with innovation. He just doesn't like to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that shows how difficult it is, right? Because when we're talking about innovation, you say radical change and so on, it's actually about being surprised. Uh, so, so what's the answer to that? Well, part of the answer is to involve the politicians in the process. Because you know, politicians and, and, and decision makers and big companies and so on actually, at a, at, a, at, a, at a theoretical level, want innovation. They want change. I mean, our government, for example, here in Denmark, they, they do want a 70% reduction of CO2 by uh, 2030. They just don't know how to do it. And they, they know they, they need innovation. The question is, when it comes to the risk, to the investments, to the changes in behavior, to what might be painful for citizens, which may not get them reelected, it's a whole different story. So there's a friction between the dream, what you want and, and dream about, also as a, in, in corporations and business, and then the practice of the hard, hard work of design and innovation and change, and those clash. So our job, as coming from the design field, I think, is to be even more inclusive of who can we involve, when and how, in those processes. For Bar Mitfin went far enough that they you know, had political agreement, they had business in, they had citizens involved. They even uh, dared work with the World Economic Forum, which is pretty crazy for a local government to work mm. with these high-flying experts, um, and try that out and have the courage to be in the room with them. But they still are you know, not necessarily implementing many of the solutions yet. I mean, that has to require investments, uh, maybe the legislative change, all those things. Citizens will have to do different things. Uh, the companies need to invest, maybe take part of the risk, so risk sharing between business and government. So all those things are really, really hard. And you can say, in a way, the easy part is the, the, the front end work of, of designers, because we don't have to live with all the changes. We can come in and, and, and help them develop it, and then good luck, you know, you go and just, why don't you just do it? And it's not just doing it, right? There's so much at stake, so much at risk. And that's maybe one reason why. Uh, 1976 to, 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 to today, uh, it feels like we're still having the same conversations. Mm -hmm. And you must be living this every day, kind of this whole new kind of multiple conversations you need to have about the designs that you want to do, the things that the ideas you want, want to fold out, that you need to get the political layer moving, you need to Our talk clients about involved I mean, at least, right? This, yeah. is, this yeah. must be this is. what it is to be a designer today, actually. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, the, as, as mentioned, the, the, the complexity um, you know, is, is, is now part of everyday life. And um, even this kind of clear distinction between what's public and what's private uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is being blurred. Um, you know, we can, we can see that just on, on, on our clients, how they need to interact, how they come from, uh, from both fields. Um, and there's also kind of a, a geographic expansion. So um, this type of, uh, you know, right now, um, you know, the, 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 the Black um, Lives Matter movement is huge. Um, and um, 
it, it does not necessarily uh, mean that designers should then um, join that movement, um, but it, it, they need to then uh, extract what's uh, positive about that movement. Um, hmm. I do believe it, it creates some value also independently, but um, so, so this um, diversity bit is actually incredibly important for design and for innovation. Like it's uh, uh, all research to this point shows that uh, the more diversity there is, um, the more innovation yeah. you actually create. And um, so, so, so this is true obviously on a, an agenda level, it's also true kind of on a um, cultural, if you want to call it ethnic uh, level, um, but also in terms of geographies. And uh, there's one example I'd like to, uh, to mention of a complete different way of seeing um, uh, design or, or rather the result of design. So um, in, in, in Europe you tend to, on well, the Western world in general, you, you tend to have a legal entity um, own that design. This or a legal entity could be a company and then maybe even you have a designer that owns the IPR, the intellectual property, etc. Um, you have some examples where that's not true. We have kind of these pockets we would call uh, commons. Um, there's also now some micro level policy things, the sand casting. So we tend to create small holes, but these two are very separate and we don't integrate them, which, which, which in a way is contrary to the movement we're, we're going um, into. But if you have a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, nations and culture cultures in Africa where uh, there's a complete different version where um, uh, the IP is not uh, about a legal entity. It's not about a person. It's about a community. Hmm. Um, and the community um, owns this um, and it's passed on by the elders from generation to generation. And, and, and this new way of, um, I mean, I, I can only think of terroir, you know, like uh, hmm. where, where Gorgonzola or Champagne or whichever hmm. uh, exists. So in a way, it's not really owned by anyone, but it's owned by that domain. Um, so, so there are new ways of seeing uh, ownership of design, which again could really um, hmm. spark kind of this, this um, uh, new stuff, uh, innovation also in terms of how hmm. Uh, public and private um, play and, and that entire complexity. Mm. Question you wanted to briefly mind. Yeah, but just um, because, I mean, right now with the upheavals we're seeing in the world, including these, these social movements, whether in climate change or in diversity, there's this call for, in a way, breaking down structures and rebuilding them or, or, or redesigning them. And, and, and the direction Jens Martin mentions could be, of course, one avenue for redesign. So. Uh, one example could be uh, the call in America for, for, for redesigning police departments. Hmm. There is a huge movement, right? Defund the police, take the money away. The question becomes, how do you then design hmm. safety uh, or, or communities uh, that, that, yeah, that are safe? Uh, is it by building a, a just another color of police departments, different uniforms, and, but the same people? Or is it a whole new system, a whole new idea about what, what is it to be safe and secure and, uh, and being a community and living together with each other. Uh, the, the direction right now in America, the design direction has been to just arm the police more. Bigger weapons, uh, more material, bigger cars, uh, tanks, whatever. Uh, question becomes, what, how could you step it back and reimagine what is not just policing, but safety in a society? And so you can say that all these uh, disruptive movements that are happening right now for good reason are maybe opening up new spaces, new questions, and, 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 and some of them are tearing down these structures. And that's where someone has to step in mm. and contribute with a design attitude, with, a des with design thinking, to, take, to contribute to that. Because I don't think that the police itself will know how to redesign itself. And I don't think the politicians and the councils around the US or elsewhere will know it either. And probably lawyers or economists won't either. But together, those actors in the system could do something if they were assisted by designers. Very good point. I think we should take a few questions before stopping today. If you have anything personal, please. Um, I'm interested because you mentioned the, the different speeds of the different levels of society. Mm -hmm. um, what, because I'm, I'm not um, so um, close to the Danish educational system, if, you, if there's something like entrepreneurial or um, experimental um, mind, open mind awareness that is teached 
Well, so I think in education we need much, much more uh, design and entrepreneurship. There are, you know, uh, modules, there are courses in primary school of some degree. There's a, a really strange one called craft and design, which is mostly about putting in nails in wood and uh, sewing something together, excuse me. It's just uh, really banal. Uh, you have uh, work on entrepreneurship for, for uh, higher education. You, of course, also have universities that specialize in that. Uh, you also have incubators for startups. We run one right here uh, at the Danish Design Center for graduates coming out of university to start their own business across all kinds of disciplines, but putting in a design attitude into it. So there are initiatives, but it's not enough. I don't think we can wait for the next generation to solve things for us. Hmm. I don't think we're investing enough in design and innovation for, for, for the next generation. We don't bring in this as a way to address problems across disciplines. In a way, you shouldn't have a course in design. You should use design into all the other disciplines, including mathematics and including all the other disciplines, in a way of learning. It's, it design can be a way of learning about how to change things in the world through the other disciplines. That's a bigger question, but that's a conversation we should probably have with the Ministry of Education here. Mm -hmm. it's, but uh, no, it's, it's not enough. Yeah, but I can imagine that um, having changes in the rule system, that even if you have those experts and they yeah. have some wonderful ideas, that society is maybe slow to. Yeah, young people, of course, can be quicker, and, and we also often involve young people. Right now, we run a project on, on, on youth who have been in foster care and, and transitioning to adulthood, and their young people are in the steering committee. So we bring the young people in to be designers of their own future, basically, or of, of other young people. But it's slow moving, true. And I think the, sp the speeds I just mentioned, look at the speed of nature. How, how long does that take to change? Uh, and look at the speed of some of our, our, our business systems, but also quite long term in terms of developing new drugs or transforming agriculture. It takes a long time as well. So actually, just taking that perspective on timelines uh, and maybe beginning to synchronize them or, or, or work with them across systems is one way to work with change. And, and, and someone, again, needs to get into the middle of that. And there's only one profession I can see can get into the middle of those complex questions. It's design. Yeah. drive a, a car to some space and then to uh, get their kids to school and then we take the whatever jetpack and fly off to work and all of this. How do we entice people that are not designers to think like a designer? You know, now we're also designing our work days and uh, working from home and working at the office and all of this. We need to, in my opinion, we need to, uh, it sounds a little bit high nose or whatever you say, but we need to uh, educate people to um, design their own days and their own lives with the things that they can use in order to have a sustainable life and also be able to have their kids in their cars or whatever. How do we not just work with the kids but also with people who are much more set in their ways and mm. um, mm. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I totally get it. Uh, obviously, it's, 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 it's difficult to, to answer because there's not one answer to it. And uh, we can't expect individuals to be uh, designers. But, but um, things uh, do change. And at some where, where it starts, obviously, it's the, the, the ease of it, the convenience. Mm -hmm. If it's easier to take that jetpack, you're going to convince uh, a lot of people. But there's also a cultural shift. So when I got into um, biking, uh, what, what was I like? I was fairly young. Uh, and yeah, anyway, before my 20s, um, the, the way I approached it was uh, to be part of these rallies and demonstrations and not, whatnot. And, and um, uh, I mean, what I ended up doing was much more uh, market driven about trying to change a culture by making it aspirational. And that can actually mm. go across sectors, right? So, so people tend to think that um, the public realm is kind of only about these kind of economic um, thoughts or analytical thoughts uh, and whatever is economically sound for you to do. Uh, but, but there are examples of this uh, not being true. Uh, for instance, I love the example of the route master. Uh, this is the, the, the double-decker bus. Um, in London that's red, the iconic one. At some point, um, the municipality realized, oh, it's not really uh, practical in terms of purchase because it's too expensive. Nobody else makes them. Well, they make them in Hong Kong, but you know, you're not going to ship them from Hong Kong. So uh, they ended up having uh, buses that were mass produced 
and right away by public demand uh, they had to change them into um, route masters back again Londoners wanted that appeal, wanted that story, that mythology, and um, they got a, a fantastic architect designer uh, called Heatherwick uh, to, to do it for them. Um, th that said, uh, I think the, the cultural shift happens when it, there's a cultural change, and uh, it has happened uh, for bicycles. It's even happened for, um, for Prince Charles, right? Prince Charles was a true tree hugger. And he was ridiculed for years because, like, you know, you know, but by those who have a, a challenge to um, and, are, and are set in their way with, um, you know, they, they, that won't embrace embrace new stuff. And this was certainly not a, a royal um, approach. Um, but now, uh, you know, you come out and you know he's he's deeply respected. He has a speech. Um, in front of heads of state in the World Economic Forum. So, um, so, so, so there is kind of this kind of economic um, uh, thought about convenience, uh, ease of convenience, and also uh, you know whatever makes sense for you rationally. But but you got to back it up with with some cultural change, and that can happen in many ways. The one I mentioned, but today it's more popular to have this kind of bottom up approach, uh, you know, with social media and whatnot. So there's not one recipe. I don't know if that answers. Uh, I'll just end by saying there's another really interesting design talk tomorrow morning at ten. Tomorrow at ten, and we'll look at the convergence between design and the natural sciences. Designers working together with astrophysicists and biologists and a lot of interesting stuff. But thank you so much, Jens Maas, and thank you so much, Christian. Thank you for having us. Take your own to go. Yeah, it's going to be awesome.